Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Is being Secretary General of the United Nations the most difficult job in the world? How did Kofi Annan, the seventh Secretary General, carry out his responsibilities? We'll be back in just a moment to talk about these and other important issues. Welcome back to our program. Today we're taking a look at one of the key players at the United Nations, and that is of the Secretary General and the role that he, or possibly she in the future, play at the UN. Also, we're going to look at the United Nations on how it can reform itself and improve its efficiency and effectiveness, and in the process, take a closer look at the seventh Secretary General of the UN, Kofi Annan. My guest today is an expert on all three of these areas. My guest today is Dr. Jean Krasno. Dr. Jean Krasno is a tenured lecturer with the Colin Powell School for Civic and Global Leadership at the City College of New York. Dr. Krasno teaches courses on the United Nations and international law at Yale and also at Columbia University. Dr. Krasno has been authorized by former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan to organize his papers for publication, a project housed within the Colin Powell Center. Dr. Jean Krasno, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate you being with me, Jean. We've got a lot of material to cover in a very a lot short to cover, time. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about the role of the Secretary General. What does the Secretary General of the UN do, in, just in general terms? Well, it's a very important position because it is the symbol of the world. It's the symbol of the United Nations. But many people don't really completely understand that the Secretary General really doesn't have a lot of power. Uh, he has no, he or she has no military at uh, the beck and call of the Secretary General and really doesn't have any, any budget, which is actually mm -hmm. determined by the General Assembly. And so really the important role of the Secretary General is moral leadership. And uh, so in that the person can fulfill that, then it becomes a very important uh, position. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to go back to that in just a moment, but I want to show the, the book that you're working on that you've already completed, and you focused on the seventh Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan, in order to highlight his collected works. And of course, there have been eight Secretaries General. Let's talk just for a moment about the collected works of Kofi Annan and how you got involved in this project. Okay, well, um, I had been following, you know, teaching courses on the UN for so many years, uh, mm -hmm. the role of the Secretary General and particularly Kofi Annan. Mm -hmm. And I have to admit I was, and still am, a great admirer of him. And I really felt that it was important for his papers, his work, to be made available to the public. And I also knew that if, it, if someone didn't do that, then these papers would be locked up in UN archives for 20 years mm -hmm. uh, with no access. And th then after that, the only way you could access, access them was to know exactly what you wanted. And I felt that the kinds of decisions that he had made and the leadership that he had provided were so important that we needed to know what was going on at the UN and the kind of internal dialogue that he was having uh, with other, the departments of peacekeeping, political affairs, and so forth, uh, and for all of that to come out. And so, you know, he agreed and we were able to do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mentioned earlier that the, there have been eight secretaries general of the United Nations. Kofi Annan was the seventh, and we'll talk about him in just a moment. But, uh, it's often said, I think it was Dog Hummers, no, it was Trig Lee, the first Secretary General, who said to Dog Hummershaw, the second Secretary General, that being Secretary General is most, the most difficult job in the world. How do you, how do you read that statement? It's, it's a very difficult job, is it? It is very difficult because you have to balance all the members of the 
of the world, the member states, 193 countries right now, and the permanent five members. You have to stay impartial. You, you can't take sides, and yet you have to lead. And when a, a country is taking the wrong avenue, you have to be very, very careful about how you state that. Uh, and, and, you know, Kofi Annan uh, at times fell into that quagmire. But uh, it was also said that SG can stand for scapegoat. So when things don't go so well, you can just blame it on the uh, Secretary General. That uh, there have been uh, there have been many cases in the past where there have been problems, and usually, some as often, nations will let these problems accumulate. Then, when they reach a crisis point, they bring them to the United Nations and say, "Here, Secretary General or Security Council or whatever, please deal with these problems." So it is it is a challenge. Now, the before I forget it, there will be a new Secretary General in 2017. Is that right, uh, Secretary General Ban Ki Moon, the eighth Secretary General? term ends at the end of 2016. How is the Secretary General selected? <laughs> well, that's a very good question, and I don't think anyone has the answer to that. <laughs> it because varies. Because it's secret. <laughs> it's, sec it's totally yeah. secretive. And uh, in the oral history study that I've done of the UN, you know, we tried to ask people uh, to tell us, oh, you know, you were inside, how did it go? And really, it's uh, very secretive discussions amongst pr primarily the permanent five members uh, who go through different uh, resumes and uh, ideas and names get you know thrown out. Uh, there's a little bit of interviewing, but none of that is made public, mm -hmm. even to the General Assembly. And then the way it's stated in the Charter is that the General Assembly elects the Secretary General, but on the nomination of the Security Council. And the Council has always only nominated one person. And that's always been a man so far. Mm -hmm. uh, so now I think the process is becoming a bit more democratic. I think there, member states are really putting some pressure on uh, to open this up and to have it a more transparent process. Mm -hmm. There has been more discussion this time, and I think at any other point yes. in history, at least yes. that I've heard of. Yes. Anyway, so the first step, obviously, is to get the approval of the five permanent members of the UN Security Council, yeah. get the, the United States, Russia, China, the UK, and France to agree, then get the Security Council to approve it. Then it goes to the General Assembly. There's been a lot of discussion this year about possibly a female, a woman yes. Yes. chairing or being the CEO being the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations. Uh, do you think that's getting any traction with various countries, with uh, some of the key players, with some of the perhaps female candidates? Well, there's a group of us that are really pushing this, and I think it is getting traction. There is some movement in the General Assembly among certain members to open up this dialogue and, and really support the idea of having a woman candidate. And of course, we're very much in favor of that. The UN has always stood for equality uh, uh, between men and women, uh, various different resolutions in the General Assembly as well as the Security Council have called for that. And yet, eight men, no women, is not equitable. Um, women make up more than 50% of the world's population, and yet a woman, you know, ha has not rep been represented. So uh, we feel that it, it's, it's not only fair, but also you can't use the excuse any longer that there are not enough qualified women to choose from. And to make that point, uh, we have set up a, a website uh, and on the website, we have launched what we call Outstanding Women of the World. Mm -hmm. And we have already have uh, 21 biographies of women uh, with their photograph, a biography, and now we're starting to add media link so you can click on it and actually hear them speaking. And we're adding to that as we go because right. we're discovering more and more women. Exactly, and the website is womansg.org, is that correct? Yes. So yes. viewers can go to that and take a look at yes, it. Yes, absolutely. What would be, uh, for obvious reasons, there are many 
obvious reasons for having a female as the next Secretary General. Are there other advantages or are there, are there any disadvantages that you see? Uh, because some cultures do not view, they don't have equal status with men. Would that be yes. a challenge with some member states of the UN? Do you see that or is, that, not a, is that a mood issue? No, it's not a mood issue. It is a challenge. Um, there are member states, you know, where discrimination against women or a, a bias perhaps against uh, women is, is very, ob you know, evident. So that is, there is pushback, absolutely. And, um, you know, what some people are saying to me, but we want the best person. Yes, of course we want the best person. And it would be a, a huge mistake to choose a woman just for being a woman and not choose the best person. But, you know, what we're saying is if you look around the world for the, the best man, you can also look around the world for the best woman. And there are so many outstanding women now. President of Croatia, uh, Irina Bokova, the head of UNESCO, uh, other heads of international organizations, presidents, prime ministers, chancellors from all parts of the world. Uh, so if you, if you really look, you can find the best person. And it really should be a woman, to be fair. Mm -hmm. We've been worried about representing different regions of the world. And that's, I think, you know, uh, an equitable, equitable solution. But we haven't thought about the fact that women live all over the world and more than half the population, and yet a woman has not been represented. Mm -hmm. And of course, Kofi Annan, <coughs> excuse me, Kofi Annan, the seventh Secretary General, Ban Ki Moon, the eighth, and the other six before those two all went through this process. Yes. And the next one, the ninth one, will be going through that also. Yes. But while we're talking about Kofi Annan, let's go to your collected works, collected papers of Kofi Annan. He was involved in a wide range of very innovative activities. Uh, one that comes to mind was the Millennium Development Goals, mm -hmm. which uh, it was this concept created in 2000. The third Millennium Development Goal was to empower women. We're talking about women. Yes, yes. So uh, what role did Kofi Annan play in that? And how is that really a very innovative initiative as far as uh, bringing the large numbers of the people around the world to focus on eight critical goals? Well, as we know, Kofi Annan uh, had been within the UN system for some 25 years before he became Secretary General. And that made a big difference because he had watched the UN during that period of time. And when he took office, he made the decision that he saw his role as returning the UN to the peoples, we the peoples of the United Nations. And uh, so his program uh, of action throughout his 10 years was always to think about the people of the world, you know, supporting human rights, um, getting the business community more uh, involved with UN activities in order for them to respect human rights. And so uh, another step along that way was to look around the world and address issues of poverty, inequality, women's issues, child mortality, um, environment, and these kind of issues, you know, as I said, he felt that he needed to use his role as what they call the bully pulpit, you know, for the people. And that was unique. That was unique, and it still is actually unique. But that's what, how he saw his role as Secretary General. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is an independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guests. We would invite our viewers to go to www.globalconnectionstelevision.com, take a look at some of our previous shows, and also make recommendations for future speakers, guests, and topics. Today we're looking at the United Nations in sort of a generic way. We're looking at the role of the Secretary General, how the Secretary General is selected. Also, we're looking at the internal efficiencies of the United Nations as well as 
looking at the seventh secretary general and some of the challenges that he confronted. My guest today is an expert on all of these issues. My guest today is Dr. Gene Krasno, who is a tenured lecturer with the Colin Powell School for Civic and Global Leadership at the City College of New York. Dr. Krasno has been authorized by former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan to organize his papers for publication a project housed within the Colin Powell Center. Gene, we're talking about Kofi Annan, the seventh Secretary General, who is from Ghana, yes. his home country, and talking about the Millennium Development Goals and how important they were. Now, building on these in the future, we're going to have the Sustainable Development Goals mm -hmm. at the end of 2015. The 15-year continuum runs out, and we're going to be looking at the 17, I think, sustainable development goals. Yes. How important will they be to focus attention on uh, reducing poverty, to promoting universal primary school education, to combating climate change? Well, I think they're very important. They're a continuation of the Millennium Development Goals. And people felt, well, we didn't completely achieve everything that was wanted by 2015. And yet, it was such a good project because it focuses the mind on very specific benchmarks, how to measure them, and, and really what it is we want to achieve. And so member states can jump on, join a particular part of it if they don't want to do everything, and focus resources, attention, uh, on achieving those kinds of goals. And it has been effective. When you take a look at the results, um, because one of the things that had to be done was they had to measure how close are we coming to these goals. And the uh, primary education has improved tremendously. The role of women becoming a part of government or uh, equalizing the education of, of girls and boys in the schools definitely improved, infant mortality rates were going down, uh, but not enough. And so it, we wanted to keep going, and yet it's a device that worked. And so the device, again, is being taken up by the member states. Mm -hmm. And the amazing thing, too, was not only did you have the 193 governments that are working on the, uh, the original eight Millennium Development Goals, but you also brought in civil society, non-governmental organizations, yes. your faith-based groups, service right. clubs like Rotary International, Lions International. These, yes. uh, these have millions of members around the world, and they can mobilize their resources and work on achieving these goals. So it's really been a, a very collective type of approach to dealing with major problems. The Another thing, as I recall about Kofi Annan, he, he had a lot of... Uh, very unique initiatives. One was his two-track reform. Uh, people have been arguing, or not arguing, but commenting or, or analyzing for years how the United Nations needed to have internal and external reforms take place. And when he came in, he had a two-track approach to reforming the UN. Uh, what did he have in mind when he implemented this, and, and how did he do it? Well, when people talk about UN reform, it depends on which side of the issue you, you want to take and how you think about UN reform. So for the developing world in many ways, what they want is greater representation. They want the, the UN to be more democratic and have more voices heard. And therefore, you need to reform the Security Council. You have to make the Council more transparent. Uh, you know, uh, changing the Human Rights Commission to the Human Rights Council, a number of initiatives in that respect that make the UN, you know, m more representative, more inclusive. On the other hand, from the other side, people look at UN reform, oh, it has to be more efficient. You know, the, the budget has to be very tight, and you have to look at results you know, almost in a corporate sense. And so you have both sides of this. And, and Kofi Annan was willing to take that on. I, I mean, he, ha he had a degree from MIT in management. And he really put that to work. Uh, so he, he did a lot in terms of both avenues of reform. But reform has to be accepted and voted upon 
by the member states. So when you get you know, resistance in terms of re reforming the Security Council, then there's only so much he can do. You know, he can put the ideas forward, uh, enlarge your freedom. The report that he put out, he had many good ideas in that. But it, it, it is up to the member states to actually jump on it. Mm -hmm. And, of course, with reform, too, you have a situation where, uh, well, he, he implemented quite a few reforms that he could mm -hmm. do on his own. Then it mm -hmm. took the other bodies, the other five organs, I guess, of the UN to implement uh, or to assist in this. But he also had a situation where you he focused on this. And, of course, Ban Ki-moon has continued a lot of the reforms and implemented many of his own. You, as a prof uh, professor of the, on the United Nations and someone who really understands the UN, uh, do you have any suggestions? or recommendations on how the UN could r make internal reforms and to become more efficient and more effective? Well, that's a very good point. So let's talk about the two ways of looking at it. So first of all, becoming a more representative. In that sense, the General Assembly can be uh, more proactive. So if, if the General Assembly says, we want a woman candidate, or we want greater transparency in the choice of a Secretary General, mm -hmm then jump on it because you have to approve it. And if, if the GA is not satisfied with that, then they can say, we won't approve your candidate unless you give us more choice, a man a wo and a woman or whatever it is. So in that sense, the GA in a democratic sense can have a, a larger voice. Um, in terms of reforming the Security Council, you, you have to have a balance because you can be more representative because the world has changed since 1945. Um, there are many more countries that are members of the UN, and the economic balance and other kinds of balances have changed. So there need to be more voices that represent the world as it is today, and I totally agree with that. But you don't want to make the council so large that it can't reach a decision, because then you won't be <laughs> effective. So you have to have representation balanced with an effective decision-making uh, process where you can reach a decision and then have the consent of the member states to carry it out. Because as I uh, say to my classes as of yesterday, uh, you know, the Security Council is the authority within the United Nations structure. And they can pass a resolution and it's law. But if the member states don't want to enforce it, they can just, by consent, they just don't have to enforce it. So you have to be uh, a leader, both at the secretary general level, but within the Security Council itself. You have to convince the other member states that this is the right decision and that they believe in it as a solution. So the philosophy really has to be, where do we want to see the UN uh, sustainably in the future. It needs to be much more of a multilateral, multipolar organization that looks uh, to sustainability, not only in governance, but in everything that we're looking at, whether it's climate change, democratization, human rights. We have to have a vision of the future and keep the member states together toward, look, working towards that. Uh, vision, and, and that mm -hmm. takes leadership. Mm -hmm. When Kofi Annan was asked what his greatest challenge was, greatest disappointment, I remember him saying several times that it was the 2003 invasion of Iraq, and of course at that time he deemed it illegal, which it was apparently by many scholars, international scholars, and people who have looked at this situation, going back at the, looking at the history of it, that it was an invasion of a sovereign country. How did he deal with that as Secretary General of the United Nations with uh, when this happened, and what did he do to try to, the UN eventually came, even though the United States went around the United Nations Security Council, the UN eventually came on board to help repair Iraq and to try to provide assistance to the Iraqis. Mm -hmm. But how did Kofi Annan deal with that? Well, as I was saying earlier, the Secretary General walks a very fine line because they have to stay impartial. And, uh, and he tried. And he said, people would ask him, is this illegal, you know, the in, in invasion in 2003? And his answer 
he would give would be, it's not in conformity of the UN Charter. Uh, because to use force, you must have the authorization of the Security Council. That's the law. And uh, one night, uh, Fred Eckert, who was his spokesman, said they had a mis made a mistake. They allowed a BBC interviewer to come in, in at 8 o'clock in the evening, and Kofi Annan was very tired. And this journalist kept pressing him. He, he would say, it's not in conformity with the UN Charter. And he said, well, that, doesn't that mean it's illegal? Isn't it illegal? And, and finally, Kofi Annan said, well, yes, I, that would mean it would be illegal. And then, of course, the next day, the headline was, Kofi Annan says war in Iraq is illegal. So he got caught. But the, but the thing is that he had to stand up for what the rest of the members of the UN were saying. Uh, and, and even though he, he wanted to remain impartial, he, in his own conscience, he, he had to say what was right. And you have to, the Secretary General has to uphold the UN Charter. Uh, so, but the U.S. didn't like that response. Exactly. Yeah. Well, Gene, our last minute, the hardest question. Yeah. What do you think is the major challenge confronting the United Nations today? Well, we have many challenges. <laughs> there are many, yes. <laughs> many challenges. I, I do think we, we really have, we're back to a stalemate in the Security Council. You know, during the Cold War, we had that stalemate, and then we had this euphoria uh, in 1992, beginning of 1992, where we thought, ah, this, this stalemate is gone between the East and the West. And for a while it was. But we're now we're back in that situation. And we have to find a way to overcome that. Mm -hmm. if, if the UN cannot overcome this kind of stalemate, then people are going to look to other organizations to solve the problems of the world. They're going to look to NATO. They're going to look to the G20. They're going to look outside regional organizations. So the UN has to be responsible uh, for the guidance of the world, and we have to overcome uh, this kind of uh, stalemate. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is the critical issue right now. Mm -hmm. And of course, this Madeleine Albright, former, she's former U.S. Ambassador to the United yes. Nations, former U.S. Secretary of State, said mm -hmm. that the UN is not perfect it, it has warts and imperfections, I'm not quoting her directly, but the UN is, is indispensable, and that is exactly what it is, uh, an organization that we have to have. If we went out of business today, we'd have to recreate it tomorrow, yeah. even yeah. with its warts and imperfections. But Dr. Jean Crastall, I want to thank you so very much for oh, a very, very interesting well. and a very informative program. You're very welcome. My pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.